I was introduced to the world of woodworking at a young age. Of course, by my own father, a master of his craft. As a young boy, I watched my father's skilled hands transform rough timbers of wood into works of art, each piece bearing the imprint of his passion and expertise. Together, we would spend countless hours in the workshop surrounded by the tools of our trade and inspired by the possibilities that lay within each piece of wood. From the simple joys of carving a small piece of wood into something artistic and to wood carving big designs. My dad passed away a few years later and had left his workshop for me. My mom told me that my dad always had a passion for me to follow in his footsteps. Decades went by and I grew up working on side projects as a hobby, selling them on Craigslist, Marketplace, Etsy, and even building custom stuff for the community. There was nothing like being in a workshop and building something from scratch with your own bare hands. I received a request from a local library that they had old furniture they were trying to restore and set up for viewing. I went over and looked at the furniture they wanted me to bring to life and I knew I could do it. I was just missing some detailed shaper tools that had finally given up on me. I found some replacements but they weren't going to get here until a month later. I knew I couldn't wait this long. I asked a friend of mine if he knew anyone who had access to some of the tools that I needed. He said he knows a guy from work that would be happy to help. And apparently, he was interested in the same stuff that I was. But he did warn me that he's a little bit... off. One morning, I drove my friend to work, so he introduced me to the guy. He seems pretty distant and withdrawn from all the others. He shakes my hand and we end up talking a little bit. He does seem really interested in the woodwork that I was doing, and we talked about different projects and such for a little while, talking about things we learned and the tools that we used. The guy warms up after a bit, and I ask him if it would be alright if I checked out some of his stuff. He kind of agrees, but it's one of those responses when somebody is trying to come up with an excuse, but they just can't. He tells me to swing by that night, he says we can talk over a few beers. That sounds good to me. But later that night, I get a call. It's the guy. He sounds very shaken up. He says things are crazy at home. And right now it's in a good time. There is a lot of noise in the background. And so he says that he will call me when things calm down. He didn't call me the next day. Nor the day after. It's not until I was ready to return the tool that I had borrowed that he calls one afternoon. He says that things have settled down for now and that he wants me to bring over some of my own work as well to compare and all that stuff. He gives me his address and I say sure and I start to head over. I quickly notice that this guy lives in the middle of nowhere. I had to call him up a few times just to find a house because it was nothing but narrow backcountry dirt roads. The house was at the end of a very long driveway and you go from dirt trails to beautiful acres of land. The driveway is littered with trees, and his house is actually pretty nice. As I come up the driveway, something strikes me as strange about the trees that I'm passing up. They all have faces carved into them, facing the driveway, twisted, painful looking expressions. I didn't think too much of it, because sometimes I make morbid stuff myself, and in fact, I was quite impressed. I mean, I have all types of scary stuff in my house. However, the amount of detail was staggering. Looking out into the tree line of the property, every tree had a painted face looking into the house. Almost like the woods were watching you wherever you were. This kind of creeped me out. Looking out was like seeing a hundred or so white faces, just crying out in pain. Kind of like they wanted your attention. I knock on the door. The guy answers with a beer in hand. He's actually much friendlier than before. He helps me carry some of my stuff in and shows me around. He seems pretty cool. I begin to notice that each room has one of those down faces hanging above the door frame. The more I saw them, the more I began to feel creeped out. Not only was I in the middle of nowhere, but something just fell off. Up close. The faces were more detailed than I had imagined. 
I asked him what his focus on the faces were for, and the guy kind of tensed up and dodged my question. Upon entering the workshop, which was super sweet by the way, he seemed to have an interest besides creepy faces. He had entire seven foot sculptures of women, men, animals, all of them very well done. And there's another large one in the back of his workshop that has a tarp over it. He looks at me, almost with a worried look and says that that one isn't done yet. But the way he says it makes me not want to press further. It was right in front of a door that I think led to another room. We began working on stuff together, trading stories and fun times about when we injured ourselves. Suddenly, out of nowhere, he changes the subject. The guy starts to ask me what I think about God and the afterlife. I tell him that I'm not super religious, but I don't rule anything out. I just don't go to church or anything. The guy gets a bit flustered by this, gets a bit loud. He says that he was told that everything was a lie. So I ask him, by who? He's kind of silent for a moment. And then he asked me if I believe in spirits. I gave him the same kind of answer. It's possible. I don't rule anything out. He then starts looking around the room as if seeing if anyone is around. Then he leans towards me. And his voice goes soft. And he whispers. I see things in the woods at dusk. I can see their shadows. Sometimes they whisper from the trees. And I can hear them. I start to think that this guy is obviously mentally disturbed. Given everything else. But I continue listening. I try to ask him what they tell him. They tell him that everything is a lie. That God is a lie. The afterlife is a lie. The only thing after dying is darkness. He says that they laugh at him. And that they leave dead animals at his tree line. At this point, I'm officially freaked out. He says sometimes they visit him at night. And each face carving represents a different spirit that has came to visit him. He says that they can't stand looking at themselves in death so they don't step within the tree line, which is why he has the entire thing carved out. I'm pretty quiet at this point. I hadn't felt goosebumps like this ever since I was a kid and I had chills running up my spine. He told me that they try to talk to him from the tree line at night, that they try to get him to leave his home. I try to change the subject, but the guy looks down and just keeps talking. He starts to get pale as a sheet, and from what I can tell, he's actually terrified. He even kind of starts looking at me with tears in his eyes. He tells me that I'm the only person he's told. Knowing that I'm a stranger, he apologizes. He says that he's scared and doesn't know what to do anymore. I try my best to awkwardly console this stranger, and the guy kind of starts to break down. Personally, I think he needs help. But I know it's not my place to try to help him, and so I regret to this day, the next thing I ask, why he's so afraid. He looks at me and says that the faces are not working anymore. Two weeks ago, he had something terrible in his living room. I ask him what it was. He walks over to the figure that's covered with the tarp and pulls it off, and he reveals the most mangled terrible thing I have ever seen. It barely resembles a human being. Shortly after this, there's a loud bang on the wall to my right. I nearly jumped out of my skin, but the guy didn't even look. Then again, another bang, and then it just continued on and on. The guy then screams towards where the noise is coming from. Stop, Stop it. it. And it ceases. After that, I just grab my stuff. I tell the guy that I'm sorry and that I have to get out of here. I fucking got out of there as quickly as possible. As I'm leaving his home and driveway, I look in the rear view mirror and the trees are darker than I ever seen. They have shadows all around them. I end up making it back home and the guy calls me a week later and apologizes. He said he was just being silly and everything is okay now and that most of it was just a joke. However, I told our mutual friend what happened and he told me that the guy actually quit and that nobody has heard from him nor could they get a hold of him after that.
This is something that happened to me a few decades ago. It's been such a long time. But I like to share this experience with everybody who likes to go hiking, or walking, or camping in the Appalachian Trail. Way back when I was in my mid-twenties, in the late 1980s, I used to be hardcore into hiking and camping, but given that my home state of Rhode Island is like the size of a postage stamp, I exhausted a lot of the more local campgrounds pretty quickly and began to long for something a little bit more on the wild side. I heard a lot of great things about the Appalachian Trail. Hiking it was a badge of honor for a lot of people who shared my passion for the outdoors. My uncle on my dad's side had hiked the whole thing over the course of a summer back in the 50s and he would never shut up about it whenever he would see me. He made it sound amazing. Like there was true wilderness out there, just waiting to be explored. So I made up my mind to mimic the journey that my uncle took over one summer. I couldn't get the time off work to walk the whole trail, but if I timed it correctly, I could walk the southern portion of the trail from Harper's Ferry to Asheville, North Carolina in just a couple of weeks. Fulfilling a hiking dream that I had for what seemed like an age. Then, in the summer of 1989, I traveled down to Harper's Ferry by bus and by train with all my hiking and camping gear on my back. After picking up a few final supplies for my journey south, I hiked up onto the Appalachian Trail and kicked off the journey of a lifetime. Needless to say, the first few days of walking were pretty tough, but I got used to the level of strain pretty quickly. I'm telling you, I've never been as hungry or tired as I was on those first few nights up in Appalachia. I brought a hammock with me as I heard some pretty intense stories about the bugs down in West Virginia. Nasty little bugs with the names like the assassin bug, which basically has a big spike for a mouth, or the cow killer ants, whose stings are so painful that they are said to have taken down an actual cow. This had to be pure rumor, but it was intimidating. So every night after my day's hike, I would take it out of my pack, unroll it, and tie it up between two trees before getting some shut-eye. It didn't make for the comfiest night's sleep I ever had, but I wasn't complaining, especially if I was able to keep the black widows off of me. But since I was out in the woods most nights, without cover, every little sound or squawk from the nightly animals would wake me up. It was irritating, sure, but it was part of being out there, bonding with nature, you can say. So this one night, I wake up pretty sure that I heard something rustling in the leaves close by. I shifted my hammock, peering over my shoulder, and then I felt my blood run cold as I saw this big dark shape looming over me. I froze for a second, feeling my eyes adjust to the darkness, and I could tell that it was a person just standing there, staring at me. In one fluid motion, I rolled out of my hammock and hit the ground running, bolting off into the trees. I didn't care who it was standing over me. Whoever does that kind of creepy shit did not have the best intentions, and I wasn't about to stick around and make small talk. I ran a safe distance into the woods, caught my breath, circled around, and then I started to sneak back towards my camp. My intention was to make sure it was clear before gathering up my stuff and moving on to a safer spot. I took it slowly, scanning the darkness for any sign of the shadowy figure, eventually finding my way back to camp, only to discover it was completely untouched, with all my gear still in the same spots. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that whoever had been standing over me just backed off to watch from a distance and was going to wait for me to come back and get my stuff before trying to ambush me. If they weren't there to steal from me, it was obvious something else they wanted, and I was dreading to think exactly what that was. But regardless, I managed to grab my stuff and get out of the area without anyone managing to sneak up on me. The next few days, I walked hard and fast, exhausting myself in my attempt to get as far away from the area as possible. After that, I figured I was safe. No one had bothered me during the previous few days of hiking, so I figured I would be okay from there on out. But I was wrong. Very wrong. Every single night since that incident, I struggled to get some sleep. 
I kept picturing that person standing over me, just staring down at me in the darkness. I had no idea how long they'd been there, or what they had in mind for me, and I was just glad that I got out of the area. But still, I didn't start to feel safe again, until I bought some fishing line from a sporting goods store in one of the small towns I had passed, which I could then use to make trip wires that ran between the trees close to where I was camping. Then, a couple of empty cans of beans that I would string together, and whoever snagged their foot on the wire would make the cans clank together, making me aware of their presence. I had one big scare when a fox snagged the line, and I rolled out of my hammock with a knife in hand, ready to take on whoever was about to creep up on me, only to see the furry little guy scurrying away into the moonlight. I did end up laughing to myself about that one, and after that, I stopped sleeping with my knife in hand, because all it was going to take was one little slip, and I would be in a whole world of trouble. About a week went by, and I had just about gotten over the whole shadowy figure in the night incident. I had to be almost a hundred miles away from where it took place, and I had no more trouble on any other night except for the incident with the fantastic Mr. Fox that just scared the life out of me. So with the help of my little tripwire alert device, I was able to start getting some sleep again without any trouble. However, that night, I woke up suddenly to find that I couldn't move. I couldn't bring my arms up from my sides at all, and the hammock material seemed to be pushed right into my face. I was cocooned by it like the fabrics was wrapped around my entire body. This only registered in my half-awake brain when I heard the sound of fabric snapping. Then, I hit the dirt, completely knocking the wind out of me. I had no idea what was going on, struggling to break out of the hammock, only I couldn't. That's when I felt the hammock being dragged across the forest floor. Then, it hit me. Whoever was dragging me across the ground had bundled me up in my own hammock with some kind of cord. They had cut the ropes tying me to the tree and was proceeding to drag me off to God knows where. I started screaming at the very top of my lungs, forever it seemed like, to let me out. But no one responded. All I could hear was the sound of the hammock's fabric rustling against the forest floor. I knew I had to think fast or whatever was going on wasn't going to end well at all. Like I said, I had stopped sleeping with my knife in my hand or nearby me in the hammock because that was just an accident waiting to happen. So I had nothing handy to cut through the material and make my escape, or so I thought. In a split second, one idea popped up. A few years back, my dad had gifted his old wristwatch to me. It was a reliable thing, but I had just one complaint about it. The little latch that kept it tied to my wrist and was actually a little sharp from the years of use. I managed to accidentally poke myself a few times within the process of picking it up, or even putting it on. It actually drew blood, so I knew what I had to do. I unbuckled the watch as quickly as I could, which wasn't easy considering I was getting dragged along the ground in the pitch darkness, and managing to pinch the sharp clasp between my thumb and index finger was even harder. But still, I managed, and when I did, I began to rake it against the fabric of the hammock. It was just as effective at cutting canvas as it was at cutting skin. And even though it took a good few tries, it didn't take long until I could see the subtle glow of the silvery moonlight from the other side. I kept cutting as quickly and quietly as I could, until there were so many cuts that I could rip myself out of this cocoon, like some terrified newborn bursting out of the womb. You'll have to excuse the analogy, but in retrospect, that's exactly what it seemed like happened. I was born again that night. I got a second chance at living. Escaping the hammock meant life because I know that staying in it would have meant death. For the second time in about 10 days, I found myself bounding through the dark woods. Only that second time, the fear I had was like 10 times what I felt the first time around. I don't even know how I managed to escape. Assuming it was the same figure standing over me the first night, they had somehow managed to track me for more than a hundred miles. And they even seemed to get past my trip wires. They were a far better woodsman than me, most likely more physically fit than me. I just know that by the time I reached the house with its lights on, 
I turned to look behind me as I was banging on the door. There was no one else around, and the family who lived there were kind enough to put me up for the night. After I called the local sheriff, who came out in the morning to help me retrace my steps through the woods. We found my camp, but not the hammock. And even though I told him everything in detail, I could tell he was very skeptical of my story. He even suggested that I most likely got lost and scared in the dark and had just ended up jumping at shadows. Maybe even had a bad dream that seemed a little too vivid because of the lack of proper rest. But I know this was real, just in the way my palms are sweating right now as I'm recounting this. I'm sure that night really did happen the way I remember it. I never did finish that dream hike. The next day, I got on a bus back to Harper's Ferry, then took the train all the way back to Providence, and I only ever told a handful of people who happened to be out on the trails. I figured not many would really believe me. They would just think I was telling a campfire tale or something. I didn't tell my hiking uncle for the longest time. I thought that maybe he was just going to laugh or tell me that I didn't have it in me to do something that tough. But when I finally told him my story, I got a reaction that I definitely wasn't expecting. He just nodded, and he told me that there were some nights that he himself didn't think that he would make it out alive. He said that there are people who live up in those mountains, who have been outlaws for generations, who live isolated, outside of the natural order of things. He has some pretty close calls himself at times, bumping into people who weren't nearly as friendly as the majority of West Virginians, and sometimes even seeing things that he knew he wasn't supposed to see. But just what those things were, he didn't seem to want to say. I always told myself that I would try my little Appalachian adventure some other time. Maybe when I'm a little bit more old, a little more wise, the trail will still be there, waiting for me. But then again, so will whoever try to drag me off that night. Growing up, I always had a thing for walking alone in the woods. I was a creative writer in school. My attention span now is far too gone to finish much writing these days. But back then, I would take a stroll through the woods to get my writing done. Just me, a pencil, and a notebook. Sometimes I would even listen to Silent Hill and Parasite Eve soundtracks. Some of those soundtracks were pretty creepy too. Yet it never creeped me out being alone in the woods listening to creepy music. I never did feel afraid. The single experience, however, has left me with the feeling of dread at the mere thought of going back into the woods alone. I still venture out there, but that peace of mind I used to have just isn't there anymore. I work at a call center, have weekends off, and I was single at the time with not too many friends. I would spend my weekends hiking and camping along the Appalachian Trail. I lived only two hours from it, and the drive itself was usually quite relaxing too. Hiking and camping alone can be difficult, and it's not something I would recommend for inexperienced hikers. Even if you follow forecasts, the weather can switch upon you when you least expect. The rare large animal encounter can happen. And sometimes you can put yourself in a very dangerous situation when you got no one with you. I sprained my ankle once on a trail in the nearby mountains. I was miles deep, and having gone in alone, I had to trek back, limping all the way. Not a fun experience at all. On a cloudy Saturday morning, I woke up early and ventured forward to the Appalachian Trail. After a couple of hours of a drive, I finally arrived. No rain at all, just yet. Even though the sky would remain overcast for my journey, I had planned on a one-night camping trip, not going too deep. I had some plans the following day for my sister's baby shower, and I didn't plan on missing it. The hiking was fairly smooth. The air that day was just the right pressure and not too humid. It was an especially comfortable hike. I never would have expected what was going to transpire. I hunkered down under a poplar tree, tearing down a cliff bar, then finished off my first bottle of water. I looked around as I enjoyed my meal, trying
trying to remember the names of the numerous different trees and shrubs around me. Then I thought about a meeting I would have to come in early for on Tuesday. It was around then that I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. I saw a human figure at the top of a dead tree about 20 yards to my right. It was small. I could very clearly make out a small coat, pants, shoes, and hair. What in the world? I wondered. My heart raced as I picked myself up and ran over towards the tree. Surely I wasn't seeing a child stuck at the very tip top of a tree in the Appalachian Trail, right? It was the most bizarre thing. I definitely panicked, to be honest. If this child fell from that height, they could be hurt. If they weren't already, that is. I mean, the figure wasn't moving at all except for their clothes blowing in the wind. Hey, you okay? I called up. No response. And there was no movement. I gulped, my heart sinking a little further. You might be thinking I should have called for help then. But I had a habit of leaving my phone in the car. I don't like looking at my screen too often, so on short hikes I like to leave it behind. I was only going to be out overnight, so I thought I wouldn't need it. I made a quick decision and I began to climb. I was in decent shape, sure, but I hadn't climbed a tree since I was what, 12 or 13? Lucky for me, this tree was nearly perfect for climbing branches all in the right places. It was only recently dead too, so none of it felt brittle yet. I had to stop several times, but eventually, exhausted, I made it close enough to the figure to reach out and touch their shoe. I poked the bottom of one of their shoes, trying to get their attention or get a response. The shoe fell the moment my finger touched it. Underneath, there was no sock, no foot. I looked closer at the rest of the figure. There was no person inside the clothes. The coat and pants were empty. And the hair, well that was especially weird. I reached up, nearly losing my hold on the tree, and inside the hood of the coat was in fact very real human hair, long and straight like it belonged to a young girl. But the strand I pulled wasn't attached to anything. I could see flakes of skin on the end of the strands, as if the hair had been yanked from someone's head. I felt vomit rising from my stomach before I could react further. And then, I heard something below me. Footsteps, slow and heavy. Then, there was a whisper, just a bit louder than the wind itself. The voice sounded feminine, but somehow, it sounded closer to me. As if the speaker was on a nearby branch. Come down. It came again suddenly after about 10 minutes of silence. I was at my limit. Then I tried resting myself on the branch below me, but it was too thin, forcing me to press my feet and legs onto it to keep my back steady against the trunk. There was no position in which I could rest. I had to get down, come down. Again, I heard the whisper. The footsteps came again too. They seemed to be just below me at the bottom of the tree. But when I looked, I saw no one. I climbed down to the next branch with my legs still wobbling. I was confident I could jump down without being hurt. I inhaled. I remember thinking, just go. And jumping at the same time. I hit the ground with both of my knees popping but I knew I was fine. And I started running as quickly as I could down the trail the way I came. I didn't even look back. I have no idea how I was even allowed to leave. Whatever I had encountered out there felt so evil. But I ran until I saw another person whose expression was one of confusion. I smiled and just continued past them. Back at my car, I called the ranger station with my phone, which had been waiting for me in the glove compartment. I reported what I found and where I found it. I couldn't help but think that maybe I should have ran instead of climbing that tree. But the idea of this poor child falling from it while I was gone, trying to find them help, was just eating at me. Now, knowing there was no child, I felt as if I had been baited. Some part of me was telling me something had laid a trap for me. Then again, why was I allowed to leave? That was the last of it. I never heard back from anyone about this encounter.
I never even heard of a similar experience. And I see no news reports about a missing child. In the end, a fear of the woods now lingers with me. And I'll be staying far away from the Appalachian Trail for the time being. My name is Tommy. I'm from a small town called Farmington in New Mexico. I live right next to the Navajo Res, near the area where they filmed Skinwalker Canyon on Ghost Adventures. The story I'm telling happened in the summer of 2014. I have many stories and a picture of a footprint from what I believe to be a child skinwalker. One night, me and my friends, Robert, Angelina, and Richard snuck out. We were just kids and didn't really know what we were doing. Robert, Angelina, and Richard were siblings. All four of us left to our friend's house about 2 a.m. It was a normal night. The insects were out for night hunting. Crickets were chirping and the shooting stars were in the sky. We went to their window. Ryan, the older brother, answered. We ended up taking Ryan and Laurel because Aaron was too tired to go anywhere. So we left. It was just me, Angelina, Richard, Robert, Ryan, and Laurel. We tracked back to our neighborhood. Angelina, being a girly girl, wanted to get on the internet. So we stopped outside one of our other friend's house. It was two in the morning, but we just needed to sit on the road to get a connection. We ended up going to this place to smoke some weed. It was an old abandoned junkyard that was in our neighborhood. We went down the long back road to reach the junkyard. There was two big storage containers. One of them had a chain and a lock. The other was open freely. We chose to hunker down in there and to smoke. So we were just smoking and talking like your average teenager does. While we were in there, nothing happened. But it was a whole different story when we left back to our roads. We went back to our friends for internet after we smoked. Angelina was sitting on the pavement part of the driveway. The rest were dirt roads. That's when my friend Robert screamed. Did, Did you, you fucking, fucking see that? that? It just it went across the, the fucking road. road. I didn't see anything being that it was dark. The only light source was the half moon reflecting in my shiny shoes. But then, that's when I saw it. It was crouched down almost looking like an alien. It had crawled back onto the dirt road and it was staring at all of us. Deep yellow eyes. The body also seemed to be glowing as well, but I'm not sure if it was the moon causing a difference in color. It then started crawling towards us and then it just stopped, backed up and disappeared into the field next to the junkyard. We all then started running back to Ryan's house. And the next night, we were being the wannabe courageous stupid teens and said that we were going to hunt this thing. Me, Richard, and Robert got some pellet guns, screwdrivers, and other steel weapons and went back to where we saw it. As we were approaching the street light, I smelled a horrible scent. I gagged. Richard being a weirdo said, it's a fucking dead body. And so then we started calling it out. Skinwalker, come out. I then called it a skinwalker bitch and we all started running away. We ran down a few blocks and started walking. And as we came across some neighbor's chickens, they started freaking out. They started clucking and they were so loud. But then, everything got silent. No bugs, just the air. We all got creeped out and we ended up going back home. The next morning we went to tell Richard and Robert's father about what happened. He was a medicine man and he yelled at us for calling out to the thing. He blessed everyone and told us to be mindful of any words that come out of us and to watch our feet and where they take us. These incidents occurred over a period of time when I was younger. However, it was only until recently that I connected the dots. 
I grew up in Louisiana, right on the outskirts of New Orleans. The city itself has so much history, stories and intrigue surrounding it, that I would be remiss to say that I didn't have other experiences involving spirits and all that, but that's a story for another time. Right after Hurricane Katrina, I was displaced by the storm and ended up staying in Florida for a little while. While there, it seemed as though every channel on the news had coverage on the horrific event. People's houses were flooded, the roads were blocked, businesses were destroyed, and to make things even worse, there were many reports of people committing some serious crimes. Part of the news covered people trying to escape the storm and the resulting aftermath, and the other half seemed to cover the dark side of humanity, vandalism, theft, looting, violence. All of that occurred while others were simply trying to survive. To make matters worse, the prisons were destroyed and a lot of the city's unmentionables started roaming the area, causing more trouble for the people who were trying to survive. Some really, really horrible stuff went on. Like, sure, this experience involved the aftermath of a horrible storm and the possible encounter with a dangerous cryptid but I'll never put it past humans to be the darkest, most cruel creatures in existence. The news covered up a lot of it. Of course, this is where people began to say, then how do you know what really happened if there was a cover up? And to you, I'll say this. I was there, in the Superdome. I hid from the prisoners when they broke in. And I, being one of the able-bodied people in the area, was able to help deal with the people who weren't as fortunate and being able to hide. Coverage about the swamps flooding, animals escaping the zoo, as well as creatures like the alligators and such, made their way into the same broken streets as the ones where people simply trying to get back to their homes. The news covered this as well. It seemed as though all manners of beasts were displaced from the storm, not just us humans. But what about the things that we are told don't exist? Is it possible that the storm impacted them as well? A few months after the storm, I eventually moved back to Louisiana and tried to put back the pieces of my life. I lost a dear friend to people who were looting. My house was in shambles and the majority of my classmates were off in different cities. Thankfully, I started dating my now wife, who is from Florida. We would take turns visiting each other every other weekend. It was a long distance thing, but we made it work. This is relevant to the story. Just trust me. One week, as I was driving my sister home from the movies, we started talking about lions. She was 13 at the time, and she had just got out from seeing the Narnia movie with her friends. We crossed a small bridge that led into our subdivision. As we turned to the corner, she said something along the lines of, and Mr. Mr. Tumnus started, started to play the flute. flute. What's a Tumnus again? I asked. He is this goat man thing. She saw my confused face and continued. He's got like the legs of a goat. However, he has horns and doesn't have any hair on his body. Like Phil, you know, from Herky. She paused mid-sentence. Ew, did Ashley get a new dog or something? And motioned towards our neighbor's yard. I glanced to the left and saw what looked like a grayish dog sort of like a greyhound, sitting in their front lawn. But something about it didn't feel right. It was skinny, like a little too skinny. Its muzzle looked too flat, and its legs were longer than I thought they should be. But I wasn't an expert in dogs, so I didn't think much of it at the time. Um, not sure, I said as we drove past their house. But I'll ask her later. We drove off with it looking in the direction of my car almost as if it were following us with its eyes. But I mean, that's what animals do, and casted it off as nothing. In passing, I texted Ashley, asking about her new creepy puppy, but she had no idea what I was talking about. She said it was most likely some stray that got a whiff of her dogs. Poor, Poor thing was, was probably malnourished, if it was as thin as you described. She said, I just wrote it off as whatever, and forgot all about it. A few weeks later, I was on the phone with my girlfriend, just talking about our respective days at school. As I walked into the kitchen to grab a Coke, Robin, my sister, was browsing her friend's MySpace page. 
and listening to Little Wayne on Pandora. As soon as I walked into the kitchen, I could barely hear what my girlfriend was saying. So I asked Robin if she would lower the music. I grabbed my Coke, a whole bag of chips, and was making my way back upstairs when I heard Robin call to me. Kuya, what's that? As a side note, Kuya in Tagalog means elder brother. She squeaked as I rounded the steps. What do you mean? I heard something from outside. I groaned. I told my girlfriend to hold on a moment as I went back down into the kitchen to see Robin peeking out through the blinds. Ew, that, that dog, dog is, is back, back, she said, closing up the laptop and heading towards the stairs. I'll be in my room. That thing really gives me the creeps. Sure enough, it was there, sitting at the edge of our property, trying to sound tough. I told my girlfriend I was going to go outside to scare off the dog and that I would call her off. In reality, I wanted to see the thing up close and actually bring it some food if it wasn't aggressive. However, if it was dangerous, I didn't want her to hear me scream like a baby. So I opened the sliding glass door that led towards my backyard and proceeded to walk over to where Robin saw the dog sitting. Now, to get an understanding of our backyard, it had a cement patio that connected to the grass, and at the very end of the yard was a canal. We had cement bases for a fence, but due to the hurricane, all work stopped there. As I approached closer, its silhouette started to make me feel uncomfortable. It did that thing with its eyes that nocturnal animals do when they reflect light, you know, making it look even more creepy. I took a deep breath and was about to let out a Hey boy, you hungry? But before those words could leave my mouth, it quickly jolted up and turned its head back towards the canal. For some reason, this caused me to freeze. I mean, the way it moved was... Off. It let out this moan, or maybe it was a growl. It sounded like the combination between a dog howling and a screaming goat, but more in sync, if that makes sense. I saw its eyes flash that eerie glow again as it spun its body around and darted down towards the canal. It was creepy, sure, but once more I wrote it off as whatever. Another week or so, one of Ashley's dogs was found dead in her backyard. Now, I didn't see it myself, but from the way she described it, the poor thing was torn to shreds, with pieces of its fur scattered all over. The general consensus was that a bobcat or some other wildcat but she wasn't convinced. Jackis was a mastiff. She kept repeating, there was no way some bobcat got to him like that. Now I know what you're thinking. It's most likely related to this thing, right? It was outside of her house that one night too. I mean, the thought crossed my mind, but I didn't want to bring it up around her. And later that same day, I was sitting on my roof. I would crawl out of my window from the second story and recline on the rooftop that hung over the garage, giving me a good view of my neighborhood and telling my girlfriend about all that has happened so far. How I kept hearing strange sounds at night and about how Jackis was found dead. I was in the middle of telling her how these sounds have been increasing in occurrence these past few days. When I heard it again, it sounded louder and much closer. Before I could ask my girlfriend if she heard it as well, she asked, what the hell was that? Confirming that she also heard it. I then proceeded to tell her my theory on how it was connected to the creepy dog. When the weekend came and my girlfriend was in town to visit, I took her and my sister out to dinner. It was a nice meal, steak, potatoes, soda. The latter isn't important because none of us had any alcohol during this meal. On the drive home, we were discussing religion and faith when Robin screamed, What the fuck? Pointing to the roof of a nearby neighbor's house. In my shock, I slammed on the brakes to get a better look. That's when we saw it. Like, really saw it. It was slender and its limbs were outstretched. The joints were bent in some unnatural posture. It had pale gray fur. No, it wasn't fur. It was skin. Its skin was pale gray, and it was stretching extremely tight over its body. It was extremely unnerving to look at it. I sat there, foot on the brake, as I tried to make sense of what it was. That's when my sister screamed, I want to go home. 
and the creature froze. Wait, I thought, did it hear us? There's no way it could hear us. The creature twitched, turning back to face us, once again hitting me with the eerie glow of its eyes. And then it skittered, like the way a lizard does, body close to the surface, over the other side of the roof, towards their backyard. I quickly called my neighbor soon as we got home and told him that we saw something on his roof. Attempting to not sound crazy, I said it looked like he had a huge possum crawling around the second story. His reply, the wife and I have been seeing this monkey looking thing hanging in the trees at night. We called animal control and they said it was most likely a possum who had escaped from a preserve. But I know what a possum looks like and that thing ain't no possum. I was more than a little confused, I guess. I mean, it looked like a long, skinny dog or something. We just saw it crack. Don't you worry though, it just sits there staring at nothing. I figure if it means any harm, it would have done so already. I guess, I said. Well, I just wanted to let you know, it's kind of weird looking. Well, if it comes in here, I'll knock it dead and mount it to my wall. He laughed. And that was the end of it. Jumping ahead here a few weeks ago, early 2020, my wife, the girlfriend from the story, and I ended up moving to Florida, became parents, and were living the good life when my sister and parents came to visit us for the weekend. When the grandparents were enjoying putting our daughter to sleep, Robin suggested looking for creepy videos on YouTube. We're horror fanatics, so why not, right? We came across a few scary story channels, and when we came across another YouTuber, he had a number list of the creepiest things ever caught on camera. It went through various ghost sightings, unexplained occurrences, and even dabbled into the unexplained creature territory. The YouTuber started to talk about the rake, some creepy pasta creature. As with the other items on the list, it had some photos and videos attached, all of which looked like whatever that is until it came across this one photo, a photo of a long creature sitting on all fours. Robin then quickly said, that looks like that thing we saw on the roof. Remember that Kuya? I looked up and squinted. Yeah, kind of. I'm surprised you remember that. No, she's right, my wife added. I remember it as well, and it did look very similar to that. We laughed it off as a strange experience and proceeded to watch the video which more or less said the rake lives within the deep woods. Reports have also cited the creature in places like Louisiana. We all froze. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as it all came crashing back. I looked up to see my wife and Robin in similar instances of all. Holy crap, I said. Now that is creepy. The video proceeded to show more convincing footage of the rake with glowing eyes through a video from a sewer tunnel. I know you know the video I'm talking about. As I watched it though, I started to feel uneasy. Those eyes, they pierced through me. I mean, that's exactly what I remember staring back at me from way before. Then the creature in the video then ducked out of view, moving in the same fluid. Yeah, jittery motion as it did on the roof. My wife and sister froze, both visually shaken. This sparked a big discussion on cryptids and the like, ending with both my wife and sister telling me to share our story. Someone has to know something, they said. Something I forgot to mention earlier was the smell. There was always this dry, musty, rotting smell lingering in the air whenever we remember seeing it but I couldn't find anything that talked about how the rake smells. Guys, did we really encounter the rake back home? Is it possible that there's more than one out there? I mean, what else could it be? I know it's hard to explain, but the creature in that video, its movement was so similar. And those eyes, one doesn't forget a sight like that. Not at all, especially once you've seen it on your neighbor's roof. My parents divorced when I was eight years old. They had just bought a house together in the woods in Walker, Louisiana. 
after seeing his relationships. I realized that this is something my father does when his marriage is rocky. He sells his house and then buys or builds a new one for the sake of distraction. I actually seen it work for him. Once engaged in a new project and excited by the possibilities, his wife might forget to ask why he was out so late, who he was with, and why he smells like another woman's perfume. Except that this time, his trick didn't work. My mother finally had enough. I don't even think we lived in the house in the woods for a full year before my mother suggested he go stay with his whore instead. I wasn't terribly upset by this. My father and I had never been close. He was a no-nonsense high school coach, and I was skinny and weird, far from the son that he actually wanted. To be fair though, he didn't try to push me into sports or pressure me to follow football. Instead, he ignored me entirely in favor of my little brother, Trent, who seemed like he was born with a ball in his hand. Trent didn't play one sport. He played every single one of them, starting when he was merely a baby. I never resented either of them for this. I merely mentioned it to help paint a picture of my brother. If Trent and I had been one person, we would actually be a very well-rounded individual. You would have me being dreamy and even tempered. Trent, sporty and rough and emotional, living up very well to the reputation that came with his bright red hair, even when he was still in diapers. You couldn't have two more opposite children, but we loved each other, especially in the early years of our parents' divorce. Even though there were three bedrooms in this house in the woods, Trent and I shared one, not wanting to be separated. That changed around the time I turned 10. I was starting to get a light dusting of very fine pubic hair, as well as the weird, self-exploring sessions that came with it. So I figured it was time to get my own room. Without so much asking my mom, I began moving my things to the room across the hall to claim my new space. We had been living in that house in the woods for a couple of years now, and even though it had felt large and empty in the days following my father's leave, now, it felt like home, and I had to claim the new room all for myself, where I wouldn't be bothered by Trent's nightlight or those soft, irritating, snuffy noises he made in his sleep. But still, even though I figured I was too old for a nightlight, the inky darkness of my room when I turned my bedside lamp off was just a bit too much. My mother would sleep in her room at the end of the hall with the door open so she could hear us if we called and she would often fall asleep watching TV. The ghostly blue glow of the TV in her room illuminated mine, just enough to pacify me. So I began sleeping with my bedroom door open. I was 10 then, but I'm 30 now. I have not been able to sleep with my bedroom door open for about 20 years because of what I saw standing in my room that night. I don't know what woke me up. I was simply awake and I hadn't been a moment before. Everything was quiet and everything was still. The sleep timer on my mother's TV must have clicked it off because there was no noise anywhere. Not even the sound of the air conditioner. Not even crickets in the woods outside. Simple. Unbroken. Silence. I lay in bed for a while, staring at my ceiling and puzzling over why I was even awake. I realized I was very cold, even though the AC wasn't running. With a small shiver, I pulled my cover around my shoulders and rolled over to my side to face my bedroom door. And there it was. As I'm typing this, a strong chill is passing through me. Even 20 years later, the thought of that thing is enough to make every hair on my body stand straight up. I actually got to pee quite badly too but I don't feel like I can move until I finish writing this and I'm done with it until I push that thing out of my head. Actually, to be honest, a small part of me is afraid that I'm writing about it tonight and that you are listening to this because what if I have somehow summoned it and it's gonna be waiting for me in the hallway when I go to the bathroom. But anyways, I'm not sure what I saw, but it was tall to a 10 year old anyways and it was very thin it seemed to shine in the thick darkness of my room 
It was so pale. Its skin seemed white and thinner than paper. Its head was round, hairless, a hairless dome. It was naked, I think, and even though I could see no privates, I could make out the sharp ridges and curves of its hips, its fingers, which hung limply at the end of flat large hands like giant white spiders. It seemed unusually long and alien to me. Whether or not it had a mouth or even a nose, I could not say. The darkness was too deep and the thing too white to even make such distinctions. The worst part about it though, was its eyes. I could see those. Or maybe it had no eyes. Maybe those round black holes in its face were empty sockets. Or maybe its brow was so heavy it was hiding them in its shadow. Whether they were there or not, I knew those eyes were looking at me. I froze. A scream rose up in me. But I didn't move. I couldn't move. The thing saw me. I knew. But maybe it didn't realize that I was looking at it. Maybe if I just kept pretending to be asleep, it would leave me alone. I dared not to close my eyes, but I couldn't let the thing out of my sight for a moment. What if it was attempting to come closer? We stared at each other for what felt like forever, but in reality, it was no more than a minute or two. Neither of us moving, neither of us making a sound, both of us just staring. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it was gone. It didn't acknowledge me. It didn't even attack me. It didn't even make a sound, except for the odd popping of its joints and the creaking of the floorboards under its feet. As it strolled down the hall to the kitchen, it was gone. But still, I couldn't move. The thing was still out there somewhere, and it was even more terrible out of sight than from when it was standing in front of me. At least when I could see it, I knew where it was and what it was up to. Now, my mind was full with horrific possibilities of what this thing might be capable of, of what kind of terrible appetites it must possess. I lay there in the dark for over an hour, fretting over the strange creature and listening to the dark, looking for any sign that it was still around, but nothing came. I took a deep breath and got ready to do the bravest thing I had done in all my 10 years. I got ready to run to my mother. I slowly slipped out of bed, expecting the moment my feet hit the floor for the thing to snatch them, but it didn't. I stepped carefully and quietly to my bedroom door, expecting that the moment I peeked my head out, it would be there, but it wasn't. I looked to my left and then I looked right. I looked to my left again, and then, in a burst of speed that I didn't even know I was capable of, I bolted down to my mother's room. My sudden and explosive entry was enough to make her stir. Drew, she said while clicking on her bedside lamp. Is that you? What's wrong? Mom, Mom, there's something in the house. I saw something looking at me. It was standing in my bedroom doorway and it was looking at me and I think it kind of looked like the kid from Powder like a bald albino or something. I was so relieved to be with her and telling her what I had saw that I didn't notice the look of shock over her face until she grabbed me and pulled me close to her. She was wide awake now and she looked terrified. What did you say? You said someone was standing in your doorway looking at you? I nodded. She turned and looked over her shoulder and that's when I realized for the first time that she wasn't alone. My brother, Trent, was asleep in the bed beside her. My mother leaped out of bed and went over to her closet where she kept her handgun. My mother hated that thing, but she insisted on having one. A single mother with only a 10 and a 6 year old needed to protect herself. Mom, what's wrong? I was starting to get scared again. She snatched the cordless phone off its cradle and called my grandfather, who lived about 2 miles away. Dad, she whispered into the receiver. I need you to stay on the phone with me. If something happens, call the police. About an hour ago, Trent came in and got in bed with me. He said he couldn't sleep because somebody was standing in his bedroom doorway watching him. And now, 
Drew just came in and told me the same thing. I think somebody's in the house. I had never heard my mother so scared. Maybe it's Tommy, or maybe it's somebody else. If it's Tommy, I'm getting a restraining order. Apparently divorce wasn't enough. Mom, it's not that. I said, it can't be. It was too thin. Dad's got a big belly. Sweetie, shh. Okay, Dad, I'm walking through the house right now. Yes, I have my gun. Drew, follow me. If anything happens, run back here and lock the door and do not open it until Grandpa or the police get here. I nodded. My mother began to move down the hall, turning on light after light as she did so, checking every room, every closet, and within a couple of minutes, the whole house had been searched. Only one room left, the kitchen. My mother entered the room and flipped on the light, seeming to fully expect my father or some crazy killer to be standing there. But no, the kitchen was empty too, and we were alone. We were safe. With a sigh of relief, my mother said goodbye to my grandfather and put the phone down on the kitchen counter. There's nobody here, Drew. You must have had a bad dream, that's all. No, Mom. I know when I'm dreaming. This wasn't a dream and Trent saw it too. Did you both watch that powder movie recently or some- Mom! I shouted. She jumped and startled. What? What is it? I pointed. The kitchen door, which led out to the backyard and to the thick, old woods beyond it, stood slightly open. I'm still not sure what I saw that night. I have thought about it and discussed it with my brother and my mother. In recent years, I even questioned my father about it. He wasn't doing too well for a couple of years following the divorce. He was doing some weird and creepy things. But no, he wasn't there that night. And to be honest, I never even thought he had. But I still had to ask, because the other options are too frightening to consider. I don't suppose I'll ever know what that thing was. Maybe that's for the best. What I do know is, I haven't slept with my bedroom door open since that night. Even if for some reason I forget to shut it all the way before I climb in bed, I won't be able to sleep until I go and close it. Because now, in every dark doorway, I see that white face. And I also see those terrible, dark eyes staring at me. Living in a small town has its advantages. For example, you get to know everyone who lives there pretty quickly. If you ever have a problem, chances are that there's someone in town with the expertise to help you. Like Jimmy, our local handyman, electrician, and plumber. If you have a household problem, Jimmy's your guy. If you got a more difficult problem, then you probably want Mac. He's our town sheriff the only law enforcement we have for a few miles. Are you feeling hungry? Then Sherry's the gal for you. She runs a diner in the center of town and her pie is out of this world. What I'm trying to say is that it pays to know people. Another thing I find fantastic about living in a small town is the sheer amount of nature that surrounds us, untouched by man. The trees seem to grow endlessly into the sky. The nearby creek is crystal clear. Not like those contaminated ones I hear about in the city, but I think the best part about living so far away from the city is the peace and quiet. It's intoxicating. Occasionally, sometimes, you'll hear the rumbling of a semi-truck passing by, but that's about it. You could step outside your door at any given time and be greeted with pure silence. I have always found the silence peaceful, like our town was secretly tucked away from the rest of the world. Even though I do enjoy the peace and quiet, that's not always the case for a lot of people. I work in the only gas station for miles, and we often get a lot of people stopping by there to refuel before heading back onto the road. Even though most of the people tend to fill up at the pump and continue their journey, sometimes I'll still get people to come inside, and they'll mention how unnaturally quiet it is in this town. Since I only lived in this town my entire life, 
I never noticed how different it is from the rest of the world. But I'll just take their word for it. It just makes me uneasy, is what one of the customers said to me when I inquired. They said they couldn't put their finger on it. Just something about the silence of our town made them uncomfortable. Well, this town makes me uncomfortable too. But it's not the silence that drives my fear. It's something that happened to me when I was a kid. My friend Tommy and I were always together as children. We would do everything together. Explore the forest, fish in the creek, play in one of the many meadows that littered our town until the moon signaled our curfew. It was early October when it happened. We were playing together as usual, riding bikes up and down the town, until he got the bright idea to pay a visit to the Blackbriar Farm. Now, this farm has a bit of history, but I'll try to sum it up. Basically, the Blackbriars were the first to settle in this town. They were a working class family, and their main export was corn. They had cornfields as far as the eye could see. The town itself was in the early stages of forming next to the farm. Then one day, in the middle of October, the entire Blackbriar family disappeared. Nobody knew why. Some people said that the head of the household, Michael Blackbriar, took sick and passed away, and at that point, the farm was too much to maintain without him, so his family left the farm for greener fields. Others think a pack of wolves or some other animal got to the family and tore them apart, and they were never seen again. Regardless of what happened, the farm was abandoned and had been left untouched for decades. For some reason, our town either didn't have the will or the means to tear the farm down and start something new, so the old farmhouse was just left standing there. Even though the house remained empty, the cornfield seemed to continue to grow year after year. They would produce and even our local market owner would pick fresh corn from the field and use it. There's no point in letting it go to waste, they would say. Then the field would wither and die, only to regrow all over again the following year. So Tommy wanted to go exploring in the field. He had this absurd notion that the Blackbriars had a stash of treasure somewhere on the farm itself. After all, they were a supplier of produce for a while, and the town didn't have a bank during those times, so they had to do something with all that money. Well, the sun was quickly setting as we approached the edge of the farm. Reluctantly, I followed Tommy into the looming forest of dried corn husk. Our footsteps crunched beneath us as we marched further inward. It was deafening how loud our footsteps were in comparison to the rest of our surroundings. As we pressed on, we began to hear a new sound. It was faint over the crunch of our footfalls at first, but as we walked closer, the sound grew louder. It was crying. Someone was sitting in the cornfield, softly crying to themselves. Unsure of the situation, I asked Tommy if we could head back, but he shook his head, mentioning that someone might need our help. We found ourselves in a small clearing in the field. On the other side from where we enter, we saw it, or I should say, her. It was a woman. She was sitting on the cold ground. She was wearing a silky white dress, which had been stained by the dirt she rested on. Long brownish black hair covered her face and shoulders. She sat facing away from us, and the sobs that she was doing seemed to reverberate off the surrounding stalks of corn. Tommy fearlessly approached her and asked her if she was alright. When he did, her sobs instantly stopped, and the overwhelming silence returned. She rose to her feet, still facing away from us. I took a step backward, while Tommy took a step ahead. Then she turned. But how she did it triggered alarms off in my head. One second, she was facing away, and in the blink of an eye, she was turned towards us, as if she were a glitch in a video game. She raised her head, and her hair parted from her face, revealing a gory facade. Its flesh clung to her skull-like tape, Half of her jawbone was exposed. Her eyes were gray and lifeless. Dirt seemed to pepper the remaining parts of her skin. 
which combined to form a sickly brownish color. Tommy and I both screamed. I immediately turned to run away, but then I heard Tommy call out to me. My body reacted on its own, and I turned back. Tommy had been grabbed. Her hand gripped his wrist so tight that even from where I was standing, I could hear the bones in Tommy's wrist begin to splinter. Her mouth began to open and separate, as if she were some sort of snake-like creature. She pulled him closer and raised him up. Tommy struggled to turn his head away from the creature to look at me and managed to say one thing to me, the last thing I would ever hear from my best friend. Run! And I did. I ran through the cornfield as fast as I could. Tears streamed down my face like a waterfall as I realized I left my best friend behind to die. I made it to my bike and pedaled as fast as I could to the police station. I told Mac everything that happened. He quickly gathered up a search party and it was almost every single person in town. After going through the cornfield for hours, they found no trace of the woman. And the only thing they found of Tommy's was a shoe. Weeks turned into months, which turned into years. Eventually, everyone in the town started to forget. It was just another tragic missing child's case to everyone, aside from Tommy's parents and myself, that is. New children began telling stories about the cornfield, how anyone who goes in is never heard from again. Those stories aren't entirely accurate because I was there with Tommy that day and I made it out alive. Not a single day goes by that I don't regret what I did and not a single night goes by that I don't have to drink myself into a drunken slumber. Ever since I started working at this gas station, I saved up enough money to move away from this town for good, to start a new life somewhere far away, away from the cornfield and away from the tragic memory of my dear friend. I plan on leaving at the end of October, but two nights ago, after I was closing up the gas station, I heard it, the silence broken by some faint sobs coming from the other side of the road. My body ceased as I saw her, standing there on the other side of the road. I wanted to believe that I was just seeing things, but I knew better than that. She was facing away from me, and without even giving her a second to turn around, I ran to my car, got inside and drove away. I'm at home right now, and I wanted to type this up before I leave this place for good. Just so whoever hears this knows how sorry I am for Tommy and to stay away from the Blackbriar farm. I'm not really sure where I'm gonna go, but I need to hurry. I left my window open, and I think I just heard some crying coming from outside. So if I don't make it, remember, if you hear a woman softly crying to herself, just stay away and call the police, or you might end up just like my best friend, Tommy. Hey everyone, in the upcoming story, I just want to give everybody a fair warning that strong language is used throughout the story. As you all know, this isn't my typical style. I have chosen to preserve the original writer's words to maintain the story the most original that I can. So again, please be aware that the story contains strong language. If you feel like skipping the story, I have included some timestamps down below in the description. Again, thank you all so much for listening. Happy Thanksgiving. I think there is something living or walking around in my ex-best friend's skin. I will tell the tale and the nopes that led up to it. It was July last year. Me and my friend are both 18 decided to go camping for a week end up not liking any of the lame paid campsites we are doing this the old way goddammit illegally camping in this amazing area far away from houses and properties the nearest town is at least half an hour drive away fuck snakes and spiders we're both australian the first few days of camping are great though it was pretty rainy. 
Every night we end up talking for hours and being hilarious. Then go to sleep in a massive swag that I brought. The place is great, but for some reason we stick together. It made me uneasy to be alone and for some reason, we always made sure we were within viewing distance of one another. One night, we ended up huddled in fear. We could hear something walking around the fucking swag. Walks around us for hours while we both nope the fuck out of there. Then we hear a fucked up screech from a distance. Noise like wind going past really fast and footsteps stomping. We're camped in the clearing. No wind can get through the trees like that. It hasn't this whole time. My friend then starts laughing. Holy fuck man. That was scary as fuck. We end up eventually going to sleep. The next day I'm cooking. Oh shit, we need more firewood. Can't leave this food because it'll burn really fast. My friend volunteers. First time one of us has gone into the wooded area alone. My friend pauses before going in. Finally summons some fucking courage and disappears from sight. I'm a fucking master chef. Not wearing my watch, but it's been like an hour. I'm nearly done cooking the stuff. I assume he's taking a shit. So I'll give that fucker some privacy. The fire begins to fail so I have to ninja get some wood and finish the meal. Eventually, I realize maybe some inbred fuckers have raped and ate my friend. Damn it, I spent ages cooking this meal. I grab my big ass knife, rifle, torch, and a bite of my delicious damper. I walk into the woods yelling for my friend. But, I feel something watching me. I begin to get scared but I'm not about to admit it. Come out you fucker, it doesn't take that long to shit. Then I see someone in the woods in front of me. And then I hear my friend laugh. But at the same time, I hear a screech behind me. Oh fuck that. I started running straight towards where I saw my friend. That fucker is unarmed. As I'm running I lose sight of my friend. I called out to him. Motherfucker. If you're dead, I will kill you. I end up breaking through the wooded area into a padlock. I see something move in the woods across the padlock. It looks big. Bigger than me. I start to consider how many bullets I have. Probably not enough. I run back through the woods to get to the campsite. And my friend is sitting there. Wearing a change of clothes. Holy fuck, man. That was scary as fuck. He laughs. Oh wait, did you hear the screech? He shakes his head. Fuck, I must be paranoid. So we dig into some delicious food. I tell him about the huge thing that I saw. And he just starts laughing again. And says, I wouldn't worry about it. That night, I'm sitting across from my friend in front of a fire. I decided to teach myself whittling. So I start to whittle away. I cut my thumb. I stick a band-aid on that shit and continue to whittle. He's reading a book and has a little light with him. The woods start rustling and shit. The crickets start chirping. But they start chirping away. My friend then starts to laugh at something that he's reading. Then I think about his laugh in the woods. I realize it's the same exact laugh as the one when the thing walked around the swag. The same laugh that he did just then. Same as the first thing he said when I found him with different clothes on back at the camp. He also said the same words. Weird. I eventually decide to drink a bit, but he's a lightweight. We both crawl into the swag laughing. I have the knife attached to my belt. Then, at some point in the night, I wake up and I find him staring at me. My drunk brain suddenly worried that he might be going homo for a second while drunk. I start to talk about this girl that I really like. He seems to be really aware and listening to everything I say. Suddenly, I feel like my bladder is gonna burst. I stagger out this little river that goes past our campsite. I take a piss in the early morning light while I'm in awe of the majesty of nature. That's when I see something gray sticking out of the riverbed. I go over and pull it out. It's the shirt that my friend was wearing yesterday before going into the woods. 
It's torn up pretty bad with a little bit of blood on it. But I'm too drunk to really put anything together. I rebury it because my drunk brain thinks putting the cotton back to nature to decompose is a great idea. I clean my hands on my pants. I climb back into the swag. And I realize that my friend has fucking gone to La La Land. I pass out and wake up a couple of hours later. My friend is still asleep. I begin to have a feeling about weird shit that's been happening. I realize that the fire needs restarting. While pushing the coals and ashes around to add more wood. I find the button of the pants that he was wearing yesterday. And a bit of a gray cotton fabric. Like the stuff from his shirt. What the fuck? Today is the day we pack up and leave. When my friend wakes up, he's being as weird as he was yesterday. I start to pack, and he gives me a weird look. So I just tell him to start helping me. He then gets to asking if I can go get some firewood because he's hungry. I tell the bitch once we're done packing, I hold his hand and go into the woods with him. Once we packed up, we both carry shit up to the car, which is hidden up near the bush track to get out of here. I check my car every day, and he follows the whole way because the dumb fuck has probably forgotten where it's at. We load up the car. I turn it on to make sure it's all good. I'm able to tune the radio, but there's a weather warning about storms hitting the area. We go back to the campsite to grab the last stuff, and we go get firewood now, he asks. My friend is standing just inside the edge of the woods. Suddenly, I get this feeling deep in my stomach. Like, fear or something. I really want to get the fuck out of here. Nah, I don't think so. There's a weather warning. We can eat some food we got left over, and we'll buy something hot when we hit the next town. It's an 8 hour drive home. While I finish up packing, he doesn't even eat anything. But the fucker has been acting weird. I then ask him if he's alright. Yeah, I'm fine. Are you sure we can't stay another night though? I don't think the storm is gonna hit here. That's when I see something move in the woods behind him. What the fuck is that? He doesn't turn around. I pull out my knife and for some reason he goes almost into a defensive pose. He gives me a weird look. Dude, there was something fucking behind you. He turns around and says, I'm sure it was nothing. While we walk up to the car, he looks behind us a few times. So I'm trying to act normal because he sure isn't. So when I was cleaning up the fire, I noticed bits of your clothes in there. He says he wrecked them while collecting firewood and didn't want to add to the rubbish to bring back. Fucking weirdo dude, he never done shit like that before. He shrugs and looks around as we get up to the car. That's when I feel like something is watching me. But once we're in the car and back out the road, I start to feel better. I keep trying to make conversation, but he doesn't put much into the conversation. I turn on the radio. Every so often, he repeats things some of the radio presenters say. While we aren't talking, I have time to think about it. Him not worry about anything is what starts to worry me. I start to think about the weird looks he's been giving me in different situations. I feel sick and horrified, and I realize the faces are most likely the faces I was pointing at him at those moments. He's been mimicking my expressions. Realize he's been repeating phrases I say, and his laugh doesn't even change. His clothes all torn up and him trying to bury them, finding them burnt after I found them, wanting me to go back into the creepy fucking woods for some reason. I decide to give a little test. Talk about some stupid shit we did as kids. So I start to ask questions. And he just says, Oh, I don't remember that part. Or just simply agrees with me. The more I think about it, I start to realize that he hasn't been acting like himself at all since he went missing while I was cooking. When we finally get to a town, I turn my phone on and I call my mom. She's glad we had fun and stuff. She can't wait for us to get back into town and spend some time with her before I go back to work. I ask him if he's going to call his parents. And he gives me a weird look again. Then he gets his phone from his backpack. 
and then grab money from our joint cash fund and buy us both lunch. He eats the almost raw steak from his burger, but doesn't want his chips or the rest of the bun or satted. He then goes in. He then comes out with two more big pieces of red steak. Done. Rare. He starts to wolf those fuckers down while I finish my meal. He then pulls out his phone again and fires off some texts. That's when I notice some wicked bruises covering his upper arms. What the fuck happened there, man? He shrugs and says that they don't hurt. Well, okay then. I then change clothes and shower there. And he is waiting by the car. I notice him staring and watching other people. And he says he doesn't want to shower. I call him a smelly fucker and he disappears for a bit. He comes back with new clothes. And he even smells like he took a shower. So then we keep on driving. And it's now nighttime, Only an hour or two out away from home. He slowly begins to join in the conversation but he doesn't sound the same as he used to. None of his speech habits are the same. No talking about the girl he's crazy about. I decide to bring up the creepy shit that happened out at the campsite. I swear. I thought about shooting that horse or whatever that big thing was out there. But I decided I liked my chances of not knowing. And he starts to laugh. And says. I wouldn't worry. About. That. I begin to feel uneasy and think that maybe this isn't my friend next to me anymore. What about that thing that walked around our tent? He gives me this weird smile. Maybe it was a werewolf. A laugh. Or a hot chick who was lost. He grins wider. Or maybe something that was just checking us out. I then feel weird again. So I force a laugh. Why would anything do that? Like some cannibal or rapist. He looks out the window. And I can't watch him because I gotta keep my eyes on the road. Maybe they wanted to get out of there. As badly as you did this morning, he says. What the fuck did he just say? I glance at him, but he's not looking at me. I can feel my knife on my hip in its holster. The rifle store away in the back. Like a skinwalker or some shit. Something like that, he says. We both go silent. Then he starts to laugh. And it's the same fucking laugh. But that would be impossible, right? I laugh. The radio goes on. And we don't even talk for the rest of the drive. I get to his house. I start to help him get his shit out of my car. And then I drive home. As I get inside, I start to shake. I'm a man. For fuck's sake. Keep it together, motherfucker. Seriously. I think my friend died out there. And there is something else living inside of him now. Not only this... But weird shit has been happening. Like his dog and cat have mysteriously disappeared. He doesn't even hang out with us as much anymore. And even the girl he liked tried to hang out with him and she says he was really fucking weird. He apparently acts almost robotic. And only eats hardly cooked meat like a fucking caveman. His mom even asked him if he had gotten into any fights. Because his skin is always bruised. Now he could have joined a fight club or something, but honestly, my best friend is a totally different guy now. The craziest thing is that he recently invited me to go camping again, to the same fucking spot. I had to say I was busy, but I'm terrified that maybe there was more than one, and when he tried to get me to go out into the woods with him, he was trying to draw me out there for the same thing to happen to me. This shit's so fucked. I ignore his calls now and whenever I get back from a swing at work, all I get is complaints about his weird behavior and people asking if he's on drugs or some shit. For God's sake, I told my friends to never take him up on a camping idea and I told the girl I like, who is now my girlfriend, that all this weird shit that's happened and she agrees that he is a totally different person. He was a stand-up guy who was hilarious and laid back and now he is almost malicious and uncaring and sometimes I can hear that fucking laugh in my head and that fucking screech and it sucks being terrified of some asshole that I used to love like my own brother 
And so this concludes this fucked up story of me being convinced that my friend is no longer human or who he used to be. I have never in my life seen anyone change like that. Some days I just fucking nope the whole thing and hope that I'm just crazy and that he's just gone on some sort of hardcore drugs. I should have asked him things that only he would know. Lie about something. Make him agree with you. And there you go. A better way to tell. Or just come clean with everything and see if he admits it in arrogance. That's pretty much what I did. And that's what set it off for me. The stupid shit we did as kids was like putting this purple goo into these girls hair. He loves to tell that story because in order to get rid of the blame on us, we put it in our own hair so we wouldn't get in trouble and they wouldn't tell. While we were driving I asked him if he remembered putting goo into girls hair. He said yes. I asked him if he remembered if it was green or blue or purple. And he said he didn't remember, but was pretty sure it was green. Now, there is no fucking way he forgot. No fucking way. He fucking told that story a couple of weeks before we went down there. I also decided to ask him about his first dog, Mo. He didn't remember shit about Mo. In fact, it made me so fucking sick of his vague fucking responses that I stopped before he realized I was getting upset. And God knows what would have happened if it realized what I was doing. But I assume it can read and it also learns very fast like his phone. When I told him to call his parents he treated his phone like he had no fucking idea. But then by the time that I bought food he was already texting people. And then how he was copying my expressions and other people's and the radio's talk. It was so fucking scary man. Maybe it makes me an asshole for being willing to drop a friendship that I had pretty much my whole life over these experiences. But honestly, what am I supposed to do? Hello officers. When I was on a camping trip with my best friend last year, we spent a good amount of the time drinking and camping on illegal ground. I'm pretty sure something ate the insides of my friend and it's now wearing him as a meat suit. You can just imagine the laugh that I would get, right? From what I know, he hasn't attacked anyone physically or asked anyone else to go camping with him. So be careful if somebody ever goes into the woods and they come back a different person. I'm a bird hunter who lives in Oregon. I have a flushing dog I train to hunt. His name is Reggie, who I take out most weekends of the hunting season to look for quail or whatever else there is. For the last three years, the only meat I have ate from mid-September through the end of January has been the birds my dog and I hunt. Also the elk or deer that I usually bag during the season. It's actually something I've become pretty passionate about. Two weekends ago was the end of quail, so I planned a day trip out to East Oregon. For those who don't know, most of Oregon is essentially a desert. The area between the Cascade Mountains and the Pacific is rainy and forested. However, with the exception of a few small mountain ranges, two-thirds of the state east of the Cascades it's just red rocks, brush, and country for hundreds of miles all the way to the Idaho border. Even though it's quite cold this time of the year, it's still amazingly beautiful with literally millions of acres of public land. I loaded Reggie and my gear into the truck early Saturday morning, several hours before sunrise, and set off. Just at first light, we got to a big, open river valley I have spent lots of time exploring, but this certain area was new to me. It was about 30 degrees, looked like a light dusting of snow the night before, but otherwise pretty dry, and would be a fairly clear day. I love these moments, maybe more than anything in life. Being the only human in a massive wild landscape, without a single trail or building for miles, the isolation, the giddiness of the upcoming adventure. 
The feeling of exploring an area that looked the same 500 years ago. The feeling of going out to get my own food. The contrast between hot coffee in my thermos and the cold winter wind on my exposed hands. All of it, just my favorite place to be. I got the dog ready and put on my boots and pack, loaded a shotgun, and we set off along the top of the valley ridge, 600 to 700 yards above the river, looking over the cold landscape. For those who never seen it, watching a hunting dog work is a truly fascinating spectacle to behold. It's honestly why I enjoy upland bird hunting so much. To me, watching a really good hunting dog actively hunt for wild game birds is honestly not that much different from watching a trained dolphin or sea lion at SeaWorld or something like that. A work dog doing its job can be so focused and intelligent, it's shocking sometimes. I train Reggie well, but so much of it is just primal. It's Reggie's sixth hunting season, so we spend hundreds of days off trail exploring the back country and we have really learned to read each other well coastal rainforest high desert alpine mountains hardwood forest farmland swamps marshes we have adventure through it all together if there's a game bird near reggie sells it i can tell by the way that he moves his tail the frequency of sniffing and the lateral angles of his turns I can tell if he smells another person from how he looks back at me. I can tell if he smells a coyote, wolf, bear, or mountain lion from how he drops his spine. I can tell if he smells an elk, deer, or moose from how he tilts his head to catch the wind. He's my best friend, and we're actually a real solid team. About an hour after we started hiking along the valley ridge, we came to a gully that cut downhill through the ridge towards the river, which we would have to cross. I picked the way down the steep rise to the other dry, boulder-filled creek bed at the bottom of the gully, where a deer trail led back up to the other side. Halfway down the slope, Reggie started acting real strange. He stopped about 30 feet in front of me, cocked his head to the side, and fixed his gaze down to our left towards the spot in the dry creek bed as it dropped down the valley. He then leaned his head, as if trying to get a better view, and then started turning around towards me without pulling his eyes off the spot, which he really only does when he's actually scared of something, like when we go to the vet, or I start up a chainsaw. Then he bolts it up the steep side of the gully to where I was standing. What is it, bud? He kept switching his gaze from my eyes to the same spot below us while pacing around in half circles. Strange. My first thought was mountain lion, which I always have at the back of my mind. They're all over the place out here. But they clear out long before they let people, let alone a person with a dog, get this close to them. We got across this gully and keep moving, so I patted the dog on the head and kept on moving down towards the bottom of the gully. Reggie stayed right on my heels the entire time. The bottom of the gully was a dry creek bed loaded with car-sized boulders with a lot of rocks and gravel running between the rock formations and steep, grassy walls of the gully. As I was crunching over the gravel, Reggie stopped in the middle of the creek bed and once again was fixed on something to our left, down the gully. This time he dropped his spine and I could see his hackles raise. Oh shit, I thought. Maybe there is some kind of animal in the rocks down there. I flipped the safety off my shotgun and started talking to Reggie in the quote-unquote cute buddy-buddy tone I use when I'm trying to calm him down. I started walking towards a big boulder in the middle of the creek bed that was blocking my view. Looked like once I was past it, I would have a clearer field of view over the entire gully all the way down to the valley side of the river. Reggie was still frozen in place. I patted his head as I passed on his right side. Once I got a few paces past him, I noticed he wasn't following me, which he always did, even if it was a bear ahead of us. I looked back at him. Let's go, bud. 
Let's go get it. He started pacing around in half circles again. With his ears back and his tall down. What the fuck I thought. Definitely never seen him do this before. Unless again. We're like at the vet. I seen him chase 400 pound black bears off my property. And squabble with countless coyotes. He's not scared of much. This got me pretty anxious. I shouldered my shotgun and decided that before we keep moving. At this point, checking behind a boulder where something had the dog all tweaked out was a safe thing to do. So I moved quickly. In my experience dealing with black bears and mountain lions, 99.9% .9 of the times you bump into one, they're terrified and run away as fast as they possibly can. Especially when surprised by something with confident movement that's making lots of noises. But definitely don't do this with a grizzly bear. I heard Reggie start following me as I started to move around the boulder. I came around the big rock on the right side. And in front of me was a big clearing in the creek bed. And a huge, big, horned sheep. A ram. No more than 25 feet in front of me. We run into big horned sheep out in this country all the time. So it wasn't that much of a surprise. What was surprising was how this thing was sitting. That's the only way I can think to describe it. It was sitting on its folded back legs like a dog or cat would, holding itself up with a straight back posture with its front legs locked in the gravel, staring straight ahead so I couldn't see its face. These are very skittish animals. They would never let a person get this close. A bunch of things went through my mind at the same time. Maybe it's dead. No, it was cold and I could see steam coming from its slow breathing. Maybe it's wounded and dying. Maybe it's stuck on some old fencing or something. Right then, Reggie started barking. Not just barking, but like snarl barking. Like he was in a fight. He's a pretty quiet dog generally. And he never barks at deer, elk, or rams. Maybe prances after them for a few seconds. That's if we bump into one when we're hiking and we spook it. But he's never been very interested in big mammals. It actually startled me. I looked back at him and he had his front legs splayed out. His head was down. His tail was down. His hackles were raised up so high that he didn't even look like Reggie no more. And he was fully showing his teeth and barking and snarling like I never seen. He looked feral, like a coyote. I could hear the snap of his teeth as he barked again and again. I looked back at the ram, still, just sitting there, unmoving, staring straight ahead. Now that was fucking strange. I never known a wild mammal to do anything but run away, terrified at the presence of a canine let alone not even move a muscle with a canine being aggressive. I was pretty convinced at that point that the ram had to be real sick or super fucked up in some way. Definitely close to death, even if it was tangled up on something. Or maybe he had got trapped in a leg snare. It would be freaking the hell out with a dog going crazy next to it, the way Reggie was. Reggie, here! I yelled to him. Here is sort of my catch-all command for him, meaning, stop what you're doing and get to my heels right fucking now. Reggie didn't even look at me. I took my shotgun in my left hand, turned and took a step towards the dog and pointed at the ground in front of me, and pretty much screamed, Reggie, here! Again, nothing. He just kept barking and snarling at the ram. That really put me on edge. He had never just completely ignored a firm command before. It's like I wasn't even there. I turned back to the ram and shouldered my shotgun again. Something was wrong. Real fucking wrong. All my years spent in the backcountry, hunting and tracking big game animals. I mean, I literally have guided ram hunts professionally just one valley over, and I had never seen anything like this. The wind was picking up down the gully. I felt its bite on my hands. The light dusting of snow from the night before was getting whipped up around the gully. I started moving around the ramp to its right, 
trying to gain some elevation to stay somewhat above it as I rounded its position to get a look at its face. Bighorn sheep don't attack people. They're skittish as hell, so I wasn't scared of that. But this thing seemed unwell, so I figured all bets were off. As I was sidestepping around it, the wind in the gully started messing with the pressure in my ears. I felt like I was landing while inside an airplane, and my eyes popping slightly dulled the volume of Reggie snarling and barking and the wind howling down around the rocks. My heart was pounding pretty good at this point. I got to a spot about eight feet directly to its right and about three to four feet above it, up the slope of the gully and could start to make out its face. My heart rate was going insane, uniquely so, to the point I actually noticed. The pressure change made it so I could hear my heart beat thundering in my ears and feeling it in my cheeks and eyes. It felt like I had taken a few Red Bulls, then sprinted a mile. Trying to calm myself down and get a grip only made me more jumpy and anxious. I took another step and could see its mouth. It was slightly open, with milky snot running from its nose and saliva dripping from its bottom lip. With little spurts and flecks shooting out every time it exhaled the steamy breath. What the fuck? I kept saying out loud. I took another step and could start to see its eyes behind the big, full curls of its horns, which were pocked with scars and abrasions from a lifetime of fighting other rams and existing in this hard, rocky country. I took another step so I was able to essentially look at it from the front for the first time and see its full features. It had tears pouring out of its eyes and it sounded almost like it was moaning. All right, I thought, this thing is incredibly fucked up. Is it a virus or something? Is its lower spine broken? I wanted to put it out of its misery, but shooting a bighorn sheep without a license is a felony with a 15,000 fine. So I started thinking about hiking back and calling the fish and game officers. I lowered my shotgun and was about to turn to go back towards the dog when it snapped its head up to the right and looked right at me. Until my last day alive, I will never forget that moment. All the wind was knocked out of me or sucked out of me. It felt like I was free falling with my stomach in my throat. I couldn't move. I pissed myself just straight up urinated in my pants for the first time since I was a baby. Tears started rolling out of my eyes down my cheeks. My hands and feet went numb. I didn't notice the dog move, but Reggie was suddenly right at my feet with a strap from my backpack in its mouth, pulling on it as hard as he could as though we were playing tug of war, yanking me back the way I had come. But I couldn't move. I couldn't raise my shotgun. Couldn't look away from the ram. I was stuck. Then, the ram started weeping. That's the only way I can describe it. Fucking weeping. It didn't move its body. Only its head. But it was whimpering and weeping. Like a fucking person. Its facial features became very human. Its eyes bulged. Its bottom lip was quivering. It was whimpering out noises like it was trying to speak between sobs while sucking in air like a crying child would. Then, unmistakably, it started speaking. Or more like it started pleading. Don't go. Don't go. Don't go. It was increasing gradually from a whimpering pleading to a desperate screaming. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was going to throw up or had already thrown up. After what felt like about 15 seconds, my dog finally yanked on my pack hard enough to get me to stumble and I lost my footing. I couldn't move my leg to replace my foot. So I went down to one knee then buckled ahead down the slope, rolling onto a shoulder and finally breaking my eye contact with the ram. The second I broke eye contact with that thing, I could breathe again, and the sensation of falling went away. Reggie was whining and barking now, right in my face licking my cheek, yanking me away from where I had fallen. I pushed myself on my palms and just screamed, Go! 
to the dog and grab my shotgun and half sprinted. Half crawled up the hill out of the gully as fast as I could. The screams of the ram were getting louder. It started to hurt my ears. Reggie was ahead of me, stopping every 20 feet or so to look at me and bark towards the noise. I could see the dog was shaking like a leaf. The screaming started to turn into a single, unbroken roar that sounded half beast and half wind. The pressure in my head was so bad that a throbbing reddish blackness flooded my vision and I could barely see. I just kept crawling and scrambling towards my dog's barking and eventually crossed the crest of the slope at the top of the gully and was on flat ground again atop the valley ridge. Right then, the roaring stopped, the wind died down, and I felt the pressure in my head give way. The darkness faded from my vision, and the light of the day filled the world again. I stood up and jogged a short distance, until a thirst like I had never felt came over me. I collapsed at the base of a rock and caught Reggie over. I took like 25 gulps of water out of my camel back. I realized I had thrown up all over myself at some point while scrambling out of the gully, or maybe before, and had a few deep cuts in my palms and knuckles. Reggie was still shaking like he had just come out of an ice bath and whining as though he was hurt. I checked him for injuries but he seemed alright. So I gave him some water and put an arm around him trying to calm him down a bit. I wiped as much of the dirt and snow cake vomit off my coat while keeping an eye and a shotgun barrel trained on the crest of the gully, expecting with a deep dread to see ram horns slowly coming over the crest. But they didn't. After a minute or so I got my shit together. I took another sip of water, stood up and booked it the entire three miles or so back to the truck jogging the entire way. As soon as I could see my truck, I fumbled my keys out of my coat pocket, unlocked it, and bolted straight for the driver's side door. I threw the dog into the passenger seat, the gun into the back seat, and piled in behind the wheel without even taking my pack off. I fired the engine up and tore down the dirt road much faster than it was safe. I got to the highway and didn't stop until we were in my driveway. It's been two weeks since that day, and I still haven't been able to sleep a full night or talk to anyone about it. The hell would I tell people without them thinking I lost my mind? Reggie has never liked sleeping in my bed before, but he's been curled up as close as he can to me every night since then. I have no way to explain what happened out there. I have no clue what it was controlling or possessing that animal. But I know one thing, it felt like there was a person inside that ram. It felt like a person's spirit was stuck in there and desperately wanted out. However, based on the way my dog was acting, I got the feeling that if I did end up helping it, I wouldn't have ever left that gully. I am sincerely terrified in a way I have never known possible. I haven't told this story in a long time. It happened to me in October, about six years ago. I told four or five people since then, and nobody believed me. I had a lot of time to think about it since then, and I think I'm finally ready to post my story somewhere. It's about a weekend I spent in the National Forest. I had been planning the trip for weeks. I made sure I had the weekend off work. I didn't make any plans. I started buying supplies a week before I went. I was going to go camping in the forest near my town. I had been camping before when I was a little kid with my parents, but never as an adult, and never by myself, and never in this forest. So I was pretty excited. Now I'm not stupid. I took all the necessary precautions. I told a few of my friends where I was going, when I was going, and when I would be back. I told them if I go missing to call the cops and all of that. I brought an extra phone battery and enough food and water to last me a fucking week. I even brought along my firearm that my dad gave me when I turned 18. I never shot the damn thing, but I figured it would at least scare off whatever the hell wanted to mess with me. 
I'm telling you all this so you know that I'm not just some dumb kid who decided that he wanted to take a trip to the forest one day and shit himself because of what he saw. I knew what I was getting into. I was ready. Just not for, well, this. So enough backstory. I'll get on with it. I left around 6 in the morning. It's an hour drive from my place so I was expecting to get there around 7. I ended up getting there at 7.30. But I didn't mind. It was a lovely day. Not a cloud in the sky. Great weather. So I was pretty satisfied with the time that I got there. I parked my car ways away from the forest. In a little clearing off the side of the road where I knew I would find it. I gathered all my things. Had a little snack. And headed off towards the forest. The next few hours are kind of boring so I'll skip over them. All you need to know is that I made my way into the forest and set up camp. I cooked myself lunch on the crummy campfire I made around noon. I saw a pair of birds dancing at each other. I even took a few pictures of some deer I saw with my phone. I couldn't get a good shot, but at least it's proof that I was there. However, something seemed off. You see, the forest is normally kind of loud. Not like city loud. But there's this constant background noise that is always going on. Rustling in the bushes. Leaves. Birds chirping. And animals prancing around. When I first got into the forest that was all well and good. But the later it got. The sounds just started to go away. It took the better part of the day for me to notice. Birds stopped chirping. The bushes stopped rustling. I stopped seeing animals too. That's actually what made me notice. At around 4 in the afternoon, I realized that I hadn't seen a bird in a while. It actually kind of creeped me out a little bit. But I brushed it off and kept enjoying the stay. I was feeling kind of lonely, with everything being so quiet. So I called up a friend and talked with him till sundown. After that, I realized it was getting late, so I hung up. I ate again and put out the fire. After a final assessment of my surroundings, and looking at the night sky, I crawled into my tent to sleep. I kept my gun loaded right next to where I slept, just in case, you know. Sleeping on the cold ground in the middle of a forest isn't that easy if you aren't used to it. And considering I hadn't done it since I was a child, I was having a little trouble. It was around two hours after I had laid down that I started hearing something in nature again. Now. If I had heard bushes rustling a few hours earlier, this would have been cause for celebration. But even Bear Grylls himself would have gotten creeped out if this was the only thing that he had heard all night. So I did what any rational human would have done and clung to the gun like it was the only thing keeping me from falling off a cliff. There was silence for a few minutes. The only thing I could hear was my own shaky breath. Then. No crunching of leaves or snapping of twigs, just the same. It was getting louder, closer to my tent. I tried to peer through the fabric that separated me from nature, but I couldn't make out a silhouette. I clutched the rifle harder, scared as any person would. I remember being sure that I would be safe though. Even bears are rare to attack camps unprovoked, but that natural human fear that was overbearing, making my mind wander and my hands shake. It stopped, close to my tent, just outside my tent. I could feel its presence near me. It was totally silent. I knew it couldn't be a bear. It would be sniffing the tent right now if it was. I doubted it was a deer. They don't come out at night. Perhaps a wolf? They normally travel in packs. And even if it were a lone wolf, it wouldn't be a threat until I heard growling. But nothing. Just silence. And then, a screech. That's when I knew that this thing wasn't anything I had seen before. Nothing makes that sort of sound. It was like a cross between some sort of bird and a human. Like the shit that you hear in movies that possesses people with their heads on backwards make. That's when I let fear take over, in my bladder, and in my hands. I fired the gun in its direction, and oh god, was that a mistake. It screeched again, and it scratched the tent, tearing through the fabric, 
leaving a massive gash in the side. That was my first look at it, if that's even what you could call it. I barely saw a silhouette through the hole in my tent, but I did see its long arms shredding the side of the tent. It was trying to get to me. I fired the gun again, but I must have missed because it didn't flinch. That's when the flight reflex took over the fight, and I only wanted to do one thing, run. I turned around and fiddled with the opening of the tent, trying to keep my eye on the beast attacking me, but also trying to secure my escape as fast as I could. I did it, and dove out of the tent, breaking into a full sprint. Behind me, I heard the thing still tearing into my tent. I thought that maybe it was mistaking its enemy, or prey, for the tent and not me. But that relief didn't last long. I was then far from the tent when I heard it prancing again. It was faster than me, gaining on me. If I tried to outrun it, I would surely be caught. Just then, in what was my crazy thinking, I stopped and dove into a thick bush near me. I remember that many animals in the forest rely on seeing movement more than anything else. So if I could stay still, then it would not see me. And this decision saved my life. It ran past me, stopping in the same place where I stopped. I didn't notice before I hid, but that spot is just under an opening in the trees. A pillar of light penetrated the darkness, and in the moonlight, I could see this thing. It was pale, and it was made even more pale by the white of the moon, and hairless, thin, like it had not ate in weeks. I want to say it looked humanoid. But comparing that thing to a human is just wrong. Its hunched back protruded out, making it look larger than any human. It stood on all fours in such a way that no human could. Its legs bent in such a fashion that it almost resembled a frog, ready to leap. It circled around, silently searching for me. I thought it was about to give up, but it threw its horrendous back upwards, and its legs straightened, and it stood on two legs, like a human, a deformed, horrific human. And then, it looked right at me. It saw me. I know it saw me. Nothing looks at you like that without seeing you. I could tell you the color of its damn eyes, and I bet you that it could tell you the color of mine. I clutched the gun close to my chest, too scared to use it, too scared to move. I closed my eyes and waiting for it to pounce, and then, I opened my eyes and it was gone. I didn't move for the rest of the night. I fell asleep in that bush, clutching my gun, until finally being awoken by the sounds of birds. Birds. Thank God, it's birds. It was already daylight. The next morning, I stood up and the things around me seemed normal. The forest was speaking once again, and there were birds and deer everywhere. I stumbled back to my camp to find my things mostly, as I had left them. My tent was unsalvageable, but I took my backpack, had something to eat, and then I left, just like I had planned. The entire trek back, I didn't stop looking around for that thing. I didn't let the gun leave my hands either. It wasn't until I got to the car that I relaxed, calling my friend to tell him I was heading home. I didn't tell him about what happened last night. I was still trying to process it myself. Shit. I don't even think I understand what happened until after the car ride home. And that's where the story ends. Six years ago. And I haven't gone camping since then. I haven't even seen the thing again. Nor have I heard of anyone who's seen it. My life has moved on completely. But I will never forget that thing. I will never forget how it stared at me. And then how it just left. It knew I was there. But it left. I don't know why it did that. And I don't think I'll ever get an answer.